Professor Harry Oldmeadow, Coordinator of Philosophy and Religious Studies at La Trobe University, Bendigo, Australia, led the audience through a rigorously objective refutation of the modernist doctrines of Nietzsche, Darwin, Freud, and Marx, as seen from a traditionalist perspective. His presentation was titled, Tradition Betrayed, The False Prophets of Modernism. My students sometimes tell me that I'm not really a teacher, I'm a wannabe preacher. Uh, and they remind me that I am at the classroom lectern, not in a pulpit. Uh, but I would like to take the opportunity to follow the example of the preacher in choosing a couple of texts for my talk. Uh, there are actually three that I'd like you to bear in mind uh, in the course of my talk. The first comes from René Guénon. While 19th century materialism closed the mind of man to what is above him, 20th century psychology opened it to what is below him. My second quote from Frithjof Schuon. I'm sure it's familiar to many of you. That which is lacking in the present world is a profound knowledge of the nature of things. The fundamental truths are always there, but they do not impose themselves because they cannot impose themselves on those unwilling to listen. And my third comes from a representative of Orthodox Christianity, Metropolitan Anthony of Sousa. The loss of God is death, desolation, hunger, separation. All the tragedy, all the tragedy of man in one word, godlessness. One of my favourite scriptural passages comes from St Paul. It is this, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. Very sage advice. But sometimes, in order to think about those things, we have to clear away the obstacles. And that's my task today, to talk about modernism, to talk about a spiritual malaise from which we all inevitably suffer one way or another. It is not an attractive subject, but it is one about which something needs to be said. And if some of my remarks sound a little extreme or intemperate, uh, I can only take refuge again in something that Fruthjof Shuon said when he was reproached with a lack of reticence in his remarks about some modern philosophers. Some people may reproach us, he said, with lack of reticence. But we would ask, what reticence is shown by philosophers who shamelessly slash at the wisdom of the centuries. Now, first of all, let us agree, ladies and gentlemen, that we are in the midst of a spiritual crisis. We're all painfully aware of the ecological crisis, a sure sign, as Professor Nasser has said many times over, of the rupture between heaven and earth, or the corruption, the cynicism, the opportunism, the hatred which is rampant in the political realm, or the meaninglessness, the sterility, the ennui that so many people feel in their personal lives with all of the associated symptoms. Let me quote a passage to you from a Hindu text, the Vishnu Purana, written a very long time ago. I've forgotten the exact date. Uh, I think it's sometime in the first millennium AD. Riches and piety will diminish daily. 
until the world will be corrupted. In those days, it will be wealth that confers distinction. Passion will be the sole reason for union between the sexes. Lies will be the only method of success in business. Women will be the objects merely of sensual gratification. The earth will be valued only for its mineral treasures. Dishonesty will be the universal means of subsistence. A simple ablution will be regarded as sufficient purification. The observances of castes, laws and institutions will no longer be in force in the Dark Age. And the ceremonies prescribed by the Vedas will be neglected. Women will obey only their whims and will be infatuated with pleasure. Men of all kinds will presumptuously regard themselves as the equals of Brahmins. The Vaisha will abandon agriculture and commerce and will earn their living by certitude or by the exercise of the mechanical professions. The dominant caste will be that of the Shudras. Now, what is modernism? It is that cluster of habits of mind, of assumptions, of attitudes, of values, which prevail in the modern world. We can trace the pedigree of these ideas back at least to the Renaissance, perhaps even further, as Dr Nasser does in his book, Man and Nature. We can trace their development through some of the events and movements which have been alluded to by the previous two speakers, particularly the scientific, well, the Renaissance, the Reformation, the scientific revolution of the 17th century, the industrial revolutions, political revolutions, the so-called triumph of democracy, and so on and so forth. Lord Northbourne, trying to sum up what all of these modern attitudes and values comprised, came up with this list of adjectives. Modernism is anti-traditional, progressive, humanistic, rationalist, materialist, experimental, individualist, egalitarian, free-thinking and intensely sentimental. Professor Nuss summed up more succinctly with four marks or four characteristics of modernism, anthropomorphism and by extension secularism, evolutionist progressivism, the absence of any sense of the sacred, and an unrelieved ignorance of metaphysical principles. It is no wonder that when Mahatma Gandhi was asked what he thought about Western civilization, his answer was, I think it would be a good idea. <laughs> what I want to do is look at four modern thinkers who characterize some of the developments which I have been talking about in very general and abstract terms to make it a little more concrete. René Gainon says in his book that the modern mentality is dominated by pseudo-mythologies. That is to say, by a set of images, by a set of stories, by a set of beliefs, which unlike genuine mythologies, do not disclose the real but actually hide it, camouflage it, obscure it. And what we're dealing with in modernism, particularly on the intellectual level, is a whole series, a whole cluster of interrelated pseudo-mythologies, which from a certain point of view, despite all of their apparent differences, are really one pseudo-mythology. I'll come back to that point a little later. So my four representatives, Darwin, Marx, Freud, Nietzsche. I just want to identify one or two key ideas with each of these figures and comment on the way in which it is symptomatic of the modernist mentality. Now, Darwinism. Let's just step back for a moment, ladies and gentlemen. Just step back from everything that you've been taught, everything that you've read, what's been indoctrinated in you at school. 
just step back for a moment, take a deep breath and calmly consider what is being proposed. What is being proposed is that a stone can turn into Mozart. <laughs> that algal slime can turn into St Francis. That from inert matter through all sorts of mysterious processes over a very, very long period of time, consciousness emerges from non-consciousness. This is the most fantastic proposition. It defies all logic, it defies all sense. And of course it flies in the face of all traditional teaching all of which insist that humankind and indeed all other creatures are the product not of an ascent out of inert matter but of a descent from a celestial realm. The key idea in Darwinism, apart from this preposterous notion that consciousness and life can emerge from dead matter, is the notion that one species can turn into another. Now Darwin may or may not have had some insight into various biological processes. I don't want to argue about that right now. But I do want to refute completely the idea that one species can turn into another. As E.F. Schumacher said in his book of some years ago, it makes as much sense to call human beings trousered apes as it does to call a dog, a barking cabbage. <laughs> the mineral, the vegetable, the animal and the human realms are quite distinct and have always been so and always will be so because all phenomena descend from their celestial archetypes. They do not grapple their way out of the primeval slime and suddenly become intelligent beings. That process is a complete nonsense. And of course, if we take the first few verses of that most exalted of mystical texts, the Gospel of St John, remind ourselves of the first few words of that Gospel and interpret them in a metaphysical and not in a strictly narrow theological fashion. In the beginning was the Word. And eventually, I think it's by verse 14, the Word becomes flesh. What is the greater significance, metaphysical significance of this passage? It is that matter comes from spirit, to put it most simply. Matter emerges from spirit. Spirit cannot emerge from matter. That would be the greater coming from the lesser. That cannot happen. But Darwinism, of course, has been seductive because it is ingenious, there's no doubt. He was a very clever person. It is an ingenious, it is elegant, it is seductive and it is absolutely pernicious because it persuades us that we are no more than biological organisms. But Darwinism was one of these mythologies which beautifully fitted the prejudices of the age and its great appeal was it that it offered an account of how life came to be and how life in its various forms appeared without the creator, without God. An account which could leave God out of the picture. I could read many passages from Darwin's works to uh, give you a fright. In fact, I'm going to read one. Listen to this. At some future period, not very distant as measured by the centuries, the civilised races of man will almost certainly exterminate and replace the savage races throughout the world. At the same time, the anthropomorphous apes will no doubt be exterminated. The break between man and his nearest allies will then be wider for it will intervene between man in a more civilised state, as we may hope, 
even than the Caucasian, and some ape as low as a, a baboon, instead of, as now, between the Negro or Australian and the gorilla. Now, here is a passage replete with the most poisonous racism, the most appallingly provincial Eurocentricism. And yet, Darwin is one of the luminaries of modern science. To question Darwin is to announce that one is some kind of fanatic or some kind of lunatic. Now, of course, it is a terrible pity that most of the opponents of Darwin uh, <coughs> mount the challenge on the wrong grounds. I'm talking, of course, about the fundamentalist creationists. But we must recognise that their fundamental intuition is correct, even if their whole mode of argumentation is, well, not to be too uncharitable, quite inadequate. Shankara says, the great Vedantan sage, 8th century, says to explain, to attempt to explain the material world without reference to the divine is like trying to explain night and day without reference to the sun. Which is to say, there can be no explanation of the material world which is restricted to a material frame of reference, but that is exactly the project of modern science. It is doomed to failure from the start because it is based on a false premise. All right, let me move along. Marx. A couple of years back, they took a poll in England. They asked people, who is the most influential thinker of the last thousand years? Not the last ten or the last hundred, the last thousand years. The runaway winner by streets, Karl Marx. I'm sure you all know a good deal about Karl Marx. Let me just recall what Friedrich Engel said at Marx's graveside at his funeral. Just as Darwin discovered the laws of development of organic nature, so Marx discovered the law of the development of human history. The simple fact hitherto concealed by an outgrowth of ideology that mankind must first of all eat, drink, have shelter and clothing before it can pursue politics, science, art, religion, etc. That therefore the production of the immediate material means and consequently the degree of economic development attained by a given people or during a given epoch form the foundation upon which the state institutions, the legal conceptions, art and even religion of the people concerned have been evolved, evolved, and in the light of which they must therefore be explained instead of vice versa as has hitherto been the case. Now, I don't know if you made sense of that somewhat labyrinthine passage, but the basic idea is very simple. You've all heard it. The material forces of history determine everything else, including art, politics, law, religion, and all the rest of it. Religion is the opium of the people. It's an instrument of class struggle. Uh, it is a sign of man's alienation and his ignorance from his true self. Marx is a humanist as well as being a child of the Enlightenment in many other ways. The belief in progress, the belief in science, the belief in the perfectibility of man. There is one terribly dangerous idea lurking in Marx's scenario, and that is utopianism. The idea that all of the wrongs of the world, all of the injustice, all of the oppressions, the crime, the suffering, is all the result of faulty social organisation and of class struggle. And that if we could eliminate the causes of class struggle, namely private property, we could organise a world in which everyone got a fair shake, everyone got a fair amount of the cake, so to speak. And as Marx said, we could fish in the morning, hunt in the afternoon, raise cattle in the evening and philosophise in the night time. A charming prospect, is it not, ladies and gentlemen? A charming prospect. And in a way we might wish that it could be true, but of course we know better. Wherein lies the danger? Once men's minds are gripped by the idea that a perfect world is possible, 
then almost anything can be justified. If you seriously believe that if we just need to reorganise the social machinery and we will end up with a perfectly equitable and fair world, then almost any price would indeed be worth paying. When Trotsky was asked what he thought about the death of six million people in the Russian Civil War, he said, regrettable, regrettable, but a small price to pay for the revolution. Freud. The moment a man questions the meaning and the value of life, he is sick. Since, objectively, neither has any existence. Did you get it? Did you hear it? This is from a letter, not in one of his published works, but in his more private and intimate moments. With a close confidant, he writes this in a letter. The moment a man questions the meaning and value of life, he is sick, since objectively neither has any existence. Now, Freud, we know, had an animus towards religion which, to use his own terms, can only be described as pathological. Uh, when he had his famous disagreement with Carl Jung, uh, Freud's reaction was, uh, again, to use a popular Freudian word, almost hysterical. His, his attack on Jung, because Jung had dared to suggest that there might be something in religion which could illuminate the human condition. Freud was outraged by this notion. Freud, like Marx, like Darwin, thought of himself as a scientist. And he said there are three great enemies of science. Art, philosophy, religion. He said art, well, we needn't worry too much about art because we all know that art is just an amusement. Philosophy. We need not worry too much about philosophy because, after all, philosophy is only for philosophers. And Freud himself said that science had delivered three massive body blows to religion, three death blows, fatal blows. The first was Copernican cosmology, the second was Darwinian evolutionism, and the third was Freudian psychoanalysis. The last contribution to the criticism of the religious Welt, Weltanschung, he wrote, was affected by psychoanalysis by showing how religion originated from the helplessness of children and by tracing its contents to the survival into maturity of the wishes and needs of childhood. In other words, religion is a kind of prolongation of childish neuroses, complexes, insecurities, uh, whatever, and obviously something that a healthy, well-adjusted adult should leave behind, dispense with. Fridjof Schuon, several times in his works, used the words, the phrase, the psychological imposture. What did he mean by this term? I'll quote a passage from him which addresses the question directly. What we term the psychological imposture is the tendency to reduce everything to psychological factors and to call into question not only what is intellectual or spiritual, the first being related to truth and the second to life in and with in and by truth, but also the human spirit as such, and thereby its capacity of adequation and still more evidently its inward illimitation and transcendence. I return to my earlier point. These theories, these mythologies, these schema of people like Darwin, Marx and Freud are not so many different ideologies and theories. They are really all the one theory in different forms, in different modes of expression. Because fundamentally, they are all based on the same premises. They are the premises of modernity, i.e. progress, evolution, uh, the triumph of science, and a whole set of ideas which people take for granted, which seem to be part of the air we breathe, which seem to be natural. But really, if you stand back and look at them, they're actually quite extraordinary. Let me give you an example. Modernism is based on the idea that everything, 
all people, everywhere, all over the globe, throughout all the centuries, what all those people in all those places and times have said about the nature of reality is wrong. The only people, the only people who know how things really are is this very small group of Western European intellectuals over the last three or four hundred years. They know. They know. Nobody else knew. They've finally woken up. All these other people believed in God. They believed in an afterlife. They believed in the primacy of the spirit. All those beliefs were wrong. We know that because the men in the white coats have told us. And that, that's it. If Stephen Hawking says that he's coming up with a grand theory of everything and that we needn't worry anymore, he's going to explain everything, well, that's fine. That's science. That's progress. It's bizarre, is it not, ladies and gentlemen? It is bizarre. It is grotesque. It is sinister. Let me turn to my fourth representative, Frederick Nietzsche. He is a much more problematic case because there are some ravishing insights in Nietzsche's work. He is a very exciting as well as a very disturbing thinker. And in a way, he, as Shuan says, he had quite a profound soul. But he was also demented. What was Nietzsche's chief legacy to the modern world? Nietzsche set off a kind of time bomb. You've all heard the phrase, the death of God, associated with Nietzsche. Nietzsche is announcing the death of God. Of course, he doesn't mean that once God was alive and is now dead, he means that a belief in God is no longer tenable. No self-respecting intellectual can any longer believe in God. He also introduced an idea which is only coming to its bitter fruition now, relativism. It's run amok now. Postmodernism is based on the idea of relativism. What's it mean? There is no absolute truth. There is no objective truth. There are only partial truths. There are only perspectives. There are only points of view. This, in a nutshell, is what relativism is. And again, of course, it flies in the face of all the traditional teachings. What do they share? Let me just quickly give you some characteristics. First, God doesn't figure. Darwin ignores the question. The other three are quite explicit. For Marx, God is a kind of projection of what humans want to be. So he's a kind of figment, a kind of illusion, a kind of larger-than-life ideal, but he, he has no objective reality. The word God doesn't refer to anything that actually exists. Freud, as we've seen, uh, regards a belief in God as a kind of childish neurosis extended into adulthood. And... Uh, Nietzsche, I'll just read you one passage from Nietzsche just to give you the idea. The law, the will of God, the sacred book, inspiration, all merely words for the conditions under which the priest comes to power and by which he maintains his power. These concepts are to be found at the basis of all priestly organisations or priestly philosophical power structures. The holy lie common to Confucius, the law book of Manu, Muhammad, the Christian church, it is not lacking in Plato. The truth exists, quote, the truth exists. This means, whenever it is heard, the priest is lying. The priest is lying. So you can see it's an attack not just on religion as such, but on the very idea of truth. The very idea of truth. Strangely enough, Nietzsche actually foresees that this might lead to the most appalling catastrophe. So God is out of the frame, out of the picture. Man takes charge. 
We're in charge of our own destiny. We can make of ourselves what we will. We can be supermen in Nietzsche's scenario. We can create a perfect society in Marx's schema and so on. Secondly, and I suppose in a way it amounts to the same thing, this is an entirely horizontal world, an entirely material world. It has no spiritual dimension, it has no transcendence, it has in a sense no verticality. Everything is flattened out into the domain of matter. Thirdly, these thinkers, and this is very characteristic of modernity, pride themselves on what is called, quite wrongly, originality. What does originality properly mean? It means correct, connected to the origins. In that sense, orig originality is an entirely wonderful thing. But what do these people mean by originality? They mean cut off from the origins. What they mean is novelty, something new, something different. But this claim in itself, which is in itself quite offensive, is also absurd because there is nothing very original about any of these thinkers. If you look into the matter, it just happened to be the case that Darwin was the one who popularised ideas which were in circulation. The same might be said of all of these thinkers. Thirdly, evolutionism, progressivism, a kind of false optimism which some of our earlier speakers have also spoken about. Concomitant with that, a contempt, it's not too strong a word, a contempt for the past, a contempt for tradition, a contempt for the great religious founders. And lastly, a degradation and an imprisonment of humankind. These thinkers, and we could, we could say the same about all of their predecessors, Copernicus and Galileo and Newton and all the rest of them, all the luminaries of modern science, we are told, free us from the shackles of the past, open our minds, liberate us, allow us to be free. This is not the case. What they are actually doing and have done is imprison us in degraded understandings of what the human condition is. The human condition without dignity, without freedom, without responsibility, without all of its grandeur. I do not want you to make the mistake of thinking that the traditional perspective sees only good in the past and in tradition and only bad in the modern world. No doubt the modern world has its compensations. Let me give you one obvious example. Here we are. Here we are all together. If you want to read the Tao Te Ching or the Upanishads or the works of Rumi, we've got the in, almost the entire treasury of the world's spiritual traditions available to us in a way that has never been the case before. This is an extraordinary privilege that we have. It's a kind of compensation for the peculiar conditions of the late Kali Yuga. As Fritz Jov Schuon says, it is not a case of identifying only good on one side and only bad on the other when we're talking about tradition and modernity. It's a matter of looking at the whole picture and realising that on the one hand we have a good which entails necessarily, given human nature and the fall and so on, a good which necessarily entails some evils, that's the world of tradition, as compared with modernity which is an evil which entails, no doubt, some good. As he says, it is quite illogical to prefer an evil which entails some good to a good which entails some evil. And if we think about it in these terms, we must see that it is on the side of tradition that the greater good lies. It is the sense of the sacred, to put things as simply as possible, it is the sense of the sacred which is missing in the modern world. It's been trampled underfoot. It's been ridiculed. It's been laughed out of existence. 
It's been negated, it's been parodied, it's been caricatured, it's been satirised. That is what we need to recover, a real sense of the sacred, to put it, as I say, in its simplest possible terms. How are we going to do this? We always have available to us, as Frithjof Schuon affirmed, the truth in its various expressions. So we have the, we have the revelations, the teachings of the great revelations, the example of the great founders, examples which cannot possibly be improved upon in any way. What Shuan refers to as these oceanic figures. We have the prophets, the sages, the saints, down through the ages. And even, even in these later days, even in the Kali Yuga, the late Kali Yuga that we're living through, there are still these remarkable exemplars. Sheikh Ahmad al Alawi, to whom uh, Dr. Mishan referred this morning, or Ramana Maharshi, or Ramakrishna, or Indian figures such as Black Elk, or even more recently Yellowtail, or the Benedictine monk Abhishekdananda, in whom I'm particularly interested at the moment, or Ananda Mai, to choose another Indian example, all, all over the world. There are still, living in our midst, saints and sages from whom we can draw inspiration and nourishment and guidance. And then, of course, there are the great traditionalists themselves about whom we have been hearing in the last day and a half. The, the towering figures, as I think Razor was saying this morning, the towering figures of Gainon and Kumaraswamy and Shuon and also, I would add, Burkhart to that triumvirate, as well as all of the others, many of whom sadly have gone to the further shore in the last few years, Dr. Lings and Alvin Moore and Whittall Perry and many others. Let me finish with two quotes, uh, one from Gainon. Those who might be tempted to give way to despair should realise that nothing accomplished in this order can ever be lost, that confusion, error and darkness can win the day only apparently and in a purely ephemeral way, that all partial and transitory disequilibrium must perforce contribute towards the greater equilibrium of the whole and that nothing can ultimately prevail against the power of truth. Their device should be that used formally by certain initiatory organisations of the West. Vincit omnia veritas. Truth conquers all. The other passage comes from a figure much beloved, I'm sure, by many of you, the great Sufi saint and sage Rumi. And it is a verse to which I return over and over again in my own faltering spiritual journey. Come, come, whoever you are, wanderer, worshipper, lover of leaving, it doesn't matter. Ours is not a caravan of despair. Come, even if you have broken your vow a thousand times. Come, come yet again, come. Peace be with you and thank you. <laughs>